Well, good morning, good morning, and good morning. Good morning. Welcome. My name is Deidre Taylor. And I'm Laura Bray. And together we co-chair the convention. We want to welcome you to the 17th Annual uh, National School-Based Health Care Center Convention. You guys look great out there. We have a full room. We have over 700 people registered. We are very happy about that. We have three people from Puerto Rico here. If you're in the room, can you please just stand up? If you're in the room. We have three people from Hawaii. Wonderful. We'd like to go home with you. We'd like to go home with you. New Mexico, 156 strong. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are very proud of the fact that you are supporting NASBIC with this convention this year, our 17th annual. And now I'm going to turn this part over to my, my co-chair. Okay. All right. So how many of you have received a capital grant from the HRSA Capital Grant Awards? <laughs> Woo! How many of you are applying in this next round? Woo! Well, we want to congratulate you, and we also want to thank all of your advocacy efforts and also HRSA for helping us put this project and this um, activity together. So I'd like to start by thanking our supporters. First of all, our premier convention partner, CVS, Caremark, Workforce Initiatives. Please give them a round of applause. They are sponsoring a luncheon today, and we would... We would love all of you to come meet with them and listen to why they support school-based health care and why they're so enthusiastic about the work that we do. So please come visit them, also visit their booth. In addition, we'd like to thank the Silver Sponsor, Covering Kids and Families from Indiana. Give them a round of applause. And a special thank you to Henry Shine Cares and Medical Products Incorporated, for donating the supplies for our oral health project. We really want to thank them for doing that. In addition, I want to put a plug in for our, our triennial census. So if you noticed on your badges, you would have had a, it, it, there's something on some of them that says, I have been counted. If you have an I have been counted on your badge, that means that your center has completed the census. So give yourselves a round of applause. If you don't have one, we'd love to get one on there for you. So we encourage you, while you're here, to stop at the NASVIC booth. We have a staff member there just dedicated to helping you deal with any problems you've had related to filling out the census, as well as paper copies that you could fill out one on and take it back home with you. I mean, give it to us and take it back home. Um, to help us fill, finish it with you later, or if you have multiple sites, whatever it takes to get this done, this is really important to do. So please visit the booth. And we also have, for those of you that at least complete one census, we have a little uh, award for you, like a little prize. So stop by the booth and check it out. Okay, we have a great program for you this year. I think we always have great programs, and every year they get better and better and better. This year we have over 18 hours of continuing education, as well as we like to have fun, so we have some wonderful fun events for you. So tonight, we start that with our opening plenary. I mean, not our opening plenary. This is the opening plenary. We start that with our opening reception, and the opening reception has all of our exhibitors, our posters, as well as flamenco dancers, a youth group that's coming to dance for us, and a wandering minstrel classical guitarist. So please come enjoy visiting and catching up with friends, old and new, and vote for the posters, the best posters, vote for the, or participate in a little scavenger hunt that we have as well, and good prizes coming for that as well. And then tomorrow night, we have a special event at the One Up Lounge. It's going to be a kind of country western celebrating that culture in New Mexico, the cowboy culture, and it's going to be at the One Up Lounge, free for all registrants. Get out your cowboy boots if you didn't bring any, put on your shorts that are blue jeans or do whatever you'd like, but come on and play pool if you want. 
There'll be dancing lessons, country, dance, country line and salsa lessons for about an hour, and then food, open bar, and a good time had by all. So please come join us for that. Last but not least, did I say an open bar? I meant a cash bar. Oh, please, yes, correct that. Okay. Correct that again. <laughs> cash bar. Sorry. <laughs> I wish it was an open bar, but it's not. Okay. Last but not least, we have a special track this year, and the special track is cultural integration. And that's in part because there are so many wonderful cultures to celebrate in the land of enchantment. And within that track, there's sexual orientation different to that culture of, of youth. There's a youth culture track. There's also information about school culture for those of us that are in healthcare and need to learn more about the school culture. There's lots of information. So please attend some of those sessions and learn more about cultural integration in the work that we do. Okay. I want to thank my co-presenter, and now I want to introduce our first guest. We have the Honorable Governor Richard B. Luarte, who is the governor of the Laguna Pueblo. He is going to open our 2012 convention with a convocation bless an, a blessing, and he is the chief executive officer of the Pueblo and upholds the customary and traditional responsibilities and duties that impact the largest Carison-speaking Pueblo in New Mexico with over 8,000 members. But most interesting, he is a former user of a school-based health center. He was an athlete in high school and he had his sports physicals done at the Acoma Canchita Laguna or known as the ACL Teen Center. That is where the youth are going for their site visit today. So they will be visiting the health center there and that Pueblo. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Governor Luarte. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Good. To Eloise and others that are here from our Pueblo. Um, it's good to see all of you this morning. Thank you for inviting me and allowing me to have a couple minutes with all of you today. Um, it is quite an honor to be standing in, in front of such a, a large and distinguished group here today, um, especially the youth. You know, the youth are, are as we're told in our tradition, um, you know, she just mentioned um, the importance of culture, and we're always reminded that our youth, I see a table of young people sitting over here, those are our most precious gifts, reason being their innocence and their closeness to our Creator. They're, they're special. Take care of them. Love them. Guide them. And so it, it's quite an honor to be here. As was mentioned, you know, I, I, growing up and going through high school at Laguna Acoma, um, the ACL Teen Center, the Acoma Canisito Laguna Teen Center was there, and that's where we got all our, our physicals done uh, for all our sports, um, basketball, football. And, and, but it was also a place where you found friends, where you found safety, where you found laughter. And so um, th those, those services that were available and the camaraderie that was there that was available through the Teen Center at Laguna Acoma, um, at, through the ACL uh, facility, um, was a wonderful service and continues to be today. It's grown um, and, and has provided much more services than um, they did in the, in the days in the past. And so thank you very much for that and, and everything that you do. We're also blessed with our Laguna Middle School where we have a, a health-based center there where our, a lot of our students benefit and my children have all gone to school there as well and have all benefited from uh, the school-based health center there at the Laguna Middle School. So. Thank you for that um, and, and the services that you do provide. And so um, without taking up uh, too much time um, from you today, I know you have a busy agenda, so I was hearing all the things that were, were coming up here. I've been asked to offer an invocation uh, to start the day off. And, you, you know, for, for me, when I say my prayers, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty private in, in that manner because I, I'm one that believes, you know, it's between me and the Creator as many of you may feel the same way. 
So as, as we start our, our prayer here, I would ask that you all pray along with me and however you pray, whatever is in your heart, that we ask for those things in particular for our young people, but also that they have the blessing. We, we always ask for, for a long life and that maybe they'll also experience um, that long life um, and you, you'll be a benefit of that. So, um, so at this point, let's um, go ahead and offer an invocation. Let's ask that you all stand and, and just offer it, pray, and however you, you feel is, is right in your manner. <clears throat> May you all be blessed with a wonderful day. I ask that, you know, the, our Creator has brought us to this wonderful day, that everything is well in this world, among our people, among our life, that the Creator continue to help us, the, continue, the Creator continue to guide us, that we be blessed with health, happiness, love, respect, a long life, and I ask that as you go through the day today, that you take the time to acknowledge one another. Those that don't know one another, say hello, how are you? Because this may be the only chance to touch someone's heart. So please do that, you know, um, for us. And on behalf of the Pueblo of Laguna, I see Eloise. I don't know if there's any other tribal members that are here, but if, if they are on behalf of um, my Pueblo and my people, we extend to you our regards, and when you get home to your homes, please um, give our regards to your families, to your homes. Um, thank you. Please take for a minute. Oh, sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tamara Copeland. I'm chairman of the board of the National Assembly on School-Based Health Care. And on behalf of NASBIC, I want to thank you, Dr. Governor Luarque, for that moving blessing and for the invocation. And have a small reminder of the day for you. It's a plaque for you both to remember the day, but also to remind you of all the children in New Mexico and all the children across the country who continue to need our powerful voices. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll give you So now it's my sincere pleasure to introduce James H. Johnson, Jr. Dr. Johnson is the William Rand Keenan, Jr. Distinguished Professor of Entrepreneurship and Strategy at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He is co-author of Six Disruptive Demographic Trends, which Census 2010 will reveal, and one of the brightest thinkers and doers in the new world of work, according to Fast Company magazine. His research has been widely cited in a number of national media outlets, including the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Detroit Free Press, Newsweek, Time Magazine, US News and World Report, and Business Week. He received his PhD from Michigan State University, his master's degree from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and his bachelor's from North Carolina Central University. Today, Dr. Johnson will take an in-depth look at population and social trends that will reshape and ultimately define our community. And more importantly, hopefully he'll pay some attention to how those trends will affect all of us in the school-based healthcare community. This is actually the third time that I've introduced Dr. Johnson in, the la in I guess, less than six months. I'm a groupie now. But I want to tell you that you guys are, are in for a phenomenal treat. Dr. James Johnson.
Thank you very much. Wow, a groupie. <laughs> good, good morning. I am delighted to be with all of you today to share a few thoughts with you uh, this morning. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I am of the opinion that uh, literally the world, but especially this country, every region of this country, every state in this great nation, including the great state of New Mexico, is in the midst of an unprecedented demographic transformation. A set of changes that are so dramatic, you're going to have to buckle your seatbelt to cope with them. And if you ignore them, you ignore them at your own peril. They will run you over if you don't pay attention to them. And in the time allotted me this morning, I want to speak with you about those big trends. I call them disruptive demographic trends, as Ms. Copeland pointed out uh, to you. And I want to talk about what they mean for the K-12 of education space uh, for all of you. Now, I fully understand that um, I have about 50 minutes. The lady came up to me earlier and said that she had a nine millimeter and she would raise a card at 10 minutes. Uh, and so when I find myself in this situation of having a short time to do a lot, I whisper to my audience the same thing that the famed Hollywood actress, the late Elizabeth Taylor, said to each one of her eight husbands when they were standing at the altar about to be married. She said to each one of them, honey, I won't keep you long. And so I managed to, my goal is to get you through this. In fact, I don't stand on stages, so I come down. Uh, my goal is to get you through this in as quickly as uh, chances uh, possible here. Um, what I want to do is talk about what the big trends are, what the challenges and opportunities are that undergird those trends, and then hopefully there will be a time for uh, discussion at the end of the day. I want to view the demographic shifts through the window of the 2010 census. All of you know that every 10 years we conduct something called the decennial census, a full count of our population. How many of you have completed your 2010 census? Don't lie, I got your Irish retinal scan, I can tell, <laughs> tell whether you've done it or not. Okay. If you will recall the 2010 census form, it was a one-pager, front and back. Depending on the number of crumb snatches you had in your house, it took between 10 and 15 seconds to figure, figure that thing out. That's radically different from the census forms of earlier periods. There was something called the census long form. You needed breakfast, you needed lunch, you needed dinner and a couple of snacks to complete that thing. They wanted to know your firstborn, your lastborn, the one you don't own up to, everything they wanted to know about you on that form. Well, we don't do the long form anymore in the decennial census because in the inner, in between censuses, we have a new data gathering tool called the American Community Survey that is administered to a rotating sample of the population on an annual basis. That in, is in essence that census long form of the past. And so uh, what I want to suggest to you is that not many new things are going to come out of the 2010 census. Uh, I think we know what the big trends are. But what I will tell you is that the 2010 census did go off without a hitch. On census day, April 1st of 2010, about 70% of the population responded to the census. And over the next two or three months, we chased down everybody else for whom we didn't have addresses and the like. Uh, and so by October, early November of census year 2010, the census was complete and by law, as you know, the uh, Constitution says that the uh, Census Bureau has to deliver to the President of the United States before December 31st of census year something called the reapportionment file. And then the fund begins this thing called redistricting and reapportionment and the like, and it will go on for a while. But. What I'm here to share with you is, is what I think the big trends are, what we already know. There are six of them. I'm going to list them, and then we're going to talk about each one of them. Uh, and then we're going to talk about them in terms of context of what it means for all of you. <clears throat> the first one is the South rises again. The second one is the browning of America. The third one is marrying out is in. The fourth one is the silver tsunami is about to hit. Better save that yeah till I finish. <laughs> the fifth one is, hmm. Some of you may have read the article by Hannah Rosen in Atlantic Magazine several months ago by that title, The End of Men. Hannah had a period at the end of the sentence. I refused to put a period at the end of the sentence. So we're going to just leave it as a question mark this morning. 
And my last one is Cooling Water from Grandma's Well and Grandpa's Too. Some of you know the song. It's one of my favorite. Reminds me of my grandmother to become a parent. What I mean by that in just a moment. Let's look at what each one of these trends mean for each of us. The first one, the South continues to rise again. I'm talking about the census region of the South, the southern United States, highlighted in red here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the South region of the country for much of the 20th century, actually for three quarters of the 20th century, was the place to leave. It was not the place to go. In fact, when I graduated from college in 1972 in North Carolina, I bought a one-way ticket. I said, I'm out of here and I ain't ever coming back again because I didn't think the South was a place for somebody who looked like me and I didn't think the opportunity structure was there for me. And so I left. I ended up in the Midwest in graduate school. Then I made my way west to California where I taught at UCLA for the first 12 years of my professional career, but I ended up back in North Carolina for good reason. But ladies and gentlemen, if you look at these data very carefully, what you will see is since 1970, we've had a profound reversal of fortunes in the South. Since 1970, the South has captured about 50% of net population growth in this country in every decade, uh, reversing that thing of outwards. And in the first decade of the new millennium, that trend continued. We added about 27 million people to our population during the first decade of the new millennium. And what you will see in that third uh, column is that about 14 million of that 26 million people settled where? in the South. The large, second largest group of people settled in the, the West region. Ladies and gentlemen, what is going on in our society today is the geographic center of our population is shifting from the Northeast and the Midwest to what? The West and the South. The real geographic center today is someplace in rural Missouri. And I'm projecting that by 2020, it's going to be in Mexico. But we'll see. And if you look at what the share of population is, you will see that 13.8 million people constituted about 51% of net growth in our population. 51% of the 26 million people were concentrated in the South. The second largest group constituted about 32% consistent with this re uh, distribution of population in the West. So the, the population is shifting, redistributing as it were. Why? It's all about migration and it's all about immigration. If you look at this data very carefully, what you will see is that between 2000 and 2008, the South was the only region of this country where everybody was moving to in larger numbers than they were leaving. Whether you talked about the total population, the African-American population, the Hispanic population, the elderly and the foreign born, everybody was moving to the South in larger numbers than they were leaving. That was the only reason, region where that was the case. Here out West, uh, most people, if you listen to the media, you think all the Hispanic dynamics are going on out west. In reality, during this period, Hispanics were leaving the west in larger numbers than they were going. So were the elderly doing that during that period. If we move to the Midwest, what you will see is the only group that were moving to the Midwest in larger numbers than they were leaving were the elderly. And my guess is after this one, they figured out that it's cold as due to over there. They're gone by now. <laughs> And if you look at the Northeast, it's kind of like when the last person leaves where they turn out the lights if there are any left on because every group was leaving the Northeast in larger numbers than they were moving to the region. And in my part of the country, in the South, all you have to do is watch license plates. Not when you're driving, but when you're in the parking lot. Watch license plates and you see this migration trend in, uh, in motion uh, every day. I told you a lie, though. It's not really about the South. It's about four states in the South. It's about Texas. It's about Florida. It's about Georgia and North Carolina. Those four states captured 71% of that net growth in population in the years, in the first decade of the new millennium. All of the other states, southern states combined, captured about 29%. So in terms of the dynamics that we're talking about, in terms of you who have the challenges in, ahead of you and the opportunities in this space, it's going to be in the south and it's going to be in particular in these other states. But all of you, as you will self see, irrespective of state, are going to be, uh, um, have 
a dramatic kind of change in place as a function of these trends. Now, undergirding this geographic redistribution of population is a profound change in the, the ethnic and racial complexion of our society, something I call the browning of America. To get you to understand what I mean by the browning of America, I need to do a very quick uh, immigration history for you. Um, these are what we call cartograms where we've exaggerated the size and shapes of foreign countries proportional to the number of legal immigrants we've invited to come to America. Everybody say legal. Legal immigrants, okay. Some of y'all didn't say it. I'll come knock you out if you don't say legal immigrants. <laughs> legal immigrants, okay. At the top of this panel, 1921 to 1960, 61 to 86, 87 to 98, focus, if you will, on the top panel on this graphic. And what you will see is that between 1921 and 1960, most of the legal immigrants who entered the United States came from where? Europe. Europe. Relatively few came from where? Asia, and a smallish proportion came from Latin America relative to Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, that was an intentional immigration pattern because until the mid-1960s, we had an immigration law that says if we were going to allow the foreign-born to come to this country, it was important that they not upset the existing racial and ethnic balance of our country. So we had an express preference for people who were phenotypically similar to Anglo-Saxons, individuals who could come to America, anglicize their names, learn to speak English. This thing called the melting pot was supposed to work. In other words, we operated on a quota system. You go back in our immigration history, in the 1880s, we had something called the Chinese Chinese exclusion law. There were certain people that we said shouldn't be allowed to come to this country because it would be culturally difficult for them to assimilate. Fast forward to the first decade of the 20th century, we had something called the Asiatic barrier region that including Japan that we didn't allow people to come to this country in large numbers. In other words, we control the composition of our population through our immigration laws. Fast forward to the middle panel in this graph, you begin to see something interesting that occur. What you will notice in the middle panel is that immigration from Europe shrinks relative to the first period. What begins to grow? Asia and Latin America assumes greater importance. How did that come about? It came about in the mid-1960s, coincident with the civil rights movement in domestic life. We liberalized our immigration laws in 1965 via something called the Hart Seller Act. It's a profound piece of legislation that is, in essence, responsible for the composition of our population today. What did the act do? It eliminated those discriminatory provisions based on geographic origin, opening up the doors of our country to people who had heretofore not been allowed to come in large numbers. So profound, we used 1965 as the demarcation to identify two groups of immigrants. Anybody arriving prior to 1965, we call them the old immigrants and the invisible minorities. Why invisible? Because they were phenotypically similar to the Anglo-Saxon model. Once you go through the assimilation process, it becomes difficult to distinguish you. Anybody arriving since 1965, we call them the new immigrants and the so-called visible minorities. Why visible? Because they are phenotypically different from the Anglo-Saxon model. Yes, they can go through the assimilation process, but you will always know that they're different. Why? Because they're phenotypically different from the typical Anglo-Saxon model. Fast forward to the third panel in this graphic, and what you see is their immigration from Europe almost disappears since the Really, since the 1960s, the, the majority of immigrants arriving in this country are from two regions of the world, Asia and Latin America, with declining uh, uh, proportions of immigrants from Europe. If you fast forward and say, then the first takeaway here is in the, under, the browning of America is this fundamental shift in the geographic origins of immigrants. The second takeaway is that the numbers change dramatically over those time periods. Look at the upper left-hand corner of this graphic. What you will see is between 1920 and 1961, we only allowed about 206,000 legal immigrants to enter the country annually. That number grew to about 561,000 between 61 and 92, about 800,000, 93 to 98, close to 900,000 during the 99-2004 period. Oh, today, since 2005, about 1.1 million people annually, all contributing to the growing diversity of our population. We also acknowledged in the mid-1960s that we were a nation of immigrants, and thus we said that people who were being persecuted in their homelands for economic, political, or religious reasons, that they too ought to be allowed to come. 
refugees, parolees, and asylees, about 2.1 million of them between 63 and 93, another 428,000, 94 to 98. You see the numbers for 99, 2004, 2005 to 2008, all contributing to the growing diversity of our population. Not much controversy about that group of folks, but when you move to the right-hand side of this graphic, people's dandruff goes up. If you listen to the illegal immigration debate, it goes something like this. Don't confuse me with the facts. It's, you know, it's only what I believe. You don't, I don't care what you say. I believe this, that, and the other. It's a highly uh, emotional, highly polarizing kind of debate. You know, illegal immigration wasn't much of a problem in America prior to 1965 for two reasons the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. You ever met anybody try to swim either one of those bodies? Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't much of a problem. But since 1965, where we have a contiguous border that has been relatively fluid until recently, this thing called illegal immigration has assumed greater importance. How important? Three to 400,000 annually. The estimates are over the last couple of decades. The current controversy about we got too many illegal immigrants in America, we need to do something to stem the tide, is not new. When I was on the faculty at UCLA in the 80s, there was a lot of discussion then in California. We got too many illegal immigrants. We need to do something to stem the tide. At that time, the federal government says, well, if we saturate labor demand, we fill every job in our economy, they'll stop coming. There's no reason for them to come. How do we propose to do that? If you something called the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, we said to illegal immigrants in America that if you have been in America since 1982, illegally, and you can document that you've been here since 1982 illegally, we will grant you amnesty, no questions asked. How could you document that you've been here illegally? A rent receipt, a clothing bill, a greasy receipt from Burger King, anything that said, I was here in 1982 and I was here illegally, federal government says we'll grant you amnesty. How many people accept the government's, federal government's off amnesty? About three million people all contributing to the growing diversity of our population. Then understand that they could further diversify the population by bringing family members via the family provision of the immigration law. So the numbers were bigger than that. But what we know is that there were about 2.7 million illegal immigrants in the country who didn't trust the federal government enough to come forward. They didn't go home. They just didn't come forward for amnesty. So by 1996, and it's estimated that there were about 5 million illegal immigrants in America. And since August 2005, if you follow the debate, that number has ranged anywhere from about 7 million to about 15 million. Now, in my business, I'm known as a business demographer. And ladies and gentlemen, I probably average three to five calls a week from the media asking me about how many illegal immigrants there are in America. And Ms. Copeland already told you of my powerful status in her life, so uh, <laughs> I knew I better bring my A-game today. So I flew here yesterday all the way on the plane. I was figging. Got here early yesterday afternoon, went straight to my room, and I figured all night long. <laughs> Got up this morning early, figging. In fact, I just finished a few minutes ago. <laughs> How many illegal immigrants in America? A lot. <laughs> the real number is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 11.5 million. Okay? Now, ladies and gentlemen, when you listen to the illegal immigration debate, what group becomes the poster child for illegal immigration? Some person of Mexican descent, surreptitiously crossing Rio Grande, right? I want to suggest to you it's a little bit more complicated than that, okay? But in order to get you to understand how complicated it is, I've got to confuse you just a little bit, okay? But it's not me confusing you, it's the way the numbers are gathered. There are actually a group of immigrants in America called non-immigrants. You got that? <laughs> group of immigrants called non-immigrants. Let's look at them. These are folk who are admitted to the country on a temporary basis. They come on visas. There are at least 68 different categories of these folk. Tourists, international students, foreign diplomats, professional baseball players, a whole group of folk. Ladies and gentlemen, if you come on a 90-day tourist visa and you stay 91 days, what are you? No, you'll call a visa overstayer. 
Ladies and gentlemen, between 40 and 45 percent of the illegal immigrants in America walk through the door with papers from the federal government. When it's time to go home, what do they do? They stay. They stay. Remember the terrorists of 9-11? Three of them had tourist visas that hadn't expired. Six of them fit the visa overstay category. Another six, we don't know how the heck they got here. And the last one came on a student visa, was supposed to come to California to learn to read and speak English, but went to Florida to flight school instead. And we now know after the fact that the flight school reported this guy to the Federal Aviation Administration, the immigration, so anybody would listen, say, we got this guy here, he can't read and speak English very well, but he wants to be a pilot. The guy could speak English well enough to tell the flight school he had no interest in learning how to land planes, only to fly. <laughs> now, why don't you hear a lot about this group of people? Well, it's big business for us. Look, ladies and gentlemen, from a, in 1981, there were about 11.8 million uh, people, non-immigrants, entering the country on an annual basis. That number by 2001, right before, or 2000, between, right before 9-11, about 33.7 million people entering the country on an annual basis via these visas. By the way, worker visas is probably the biggest category. When you talk about work visas, think of the letters in the alphabet from A to Z. There's a work category for just about every letter in the alphabet. And the way you identify these categories is that, that there's three indicators for a visa category. The first indicator is a capital alphabet. Then there's a number. And then there's a lowercase alphabet. You can sing a song about it. So it's the H2A, the H2B, the LV1, the LV2. It just goes on and on in terms of these visa categories uh, that we have in terms of transformations. My message to you about this group of immigrants, ladies and gentlemen, is that if you're worried about homeland security, it's probably not the poor Mexican immigrant trying to find a job and to take care of his or her family. It's the people that uh, enter surreptitiously because they come from all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, in fact, don't be offended. They look a lot like the people in this room. In fact, I don't know who in here is illegal. I'm going to find out before I <laughs> This group of immigrants are more likely to be well-educated and they could be sitting beside you in some of the most sensitive areas of our economy and you not know it. What's my message here? If we're going to have a, a, a debate about illegal immigration, let's make it an honest debate and let's not hijack it in one way that's misleading uh, in terms of all the things that we have to do. <laughs> more generally, in talking about the changing composition of our population, what you see is, as we liberalized our immigration laws in the 1960s, you see that incredible takeoff uh, in the growth of our population. Uh, we today, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 37 million people who are foreign born in our country. That number hasn't changed dramatically since 2007 because of We've uh, we tightened our borders and made it more difficult for people to come. Uh, and uh, some people have been forced to leave and the like through deportations and like. It hasn't changed very dramatically. What does it mean in terms of the browning of America? You can divide our population into two groups, those of us who are non-Hispanic and those of us who are Hispanic. You can look at this graphic. For the first decade of the new millennium, what you will see on the last row of this graphic is that the Hispanic population grew by about 36% during the first decade of the new millennium. You go back up there and look at the non-Hispanic population, it grew by about what? 4.9%. Now, you can unpackage the non-Hispanic population into whites, blacks, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, Asians, and Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islands, and people who are two or more races. If you look at the non-Hispanic white population, what you will see, it grew by what? 2.1%. All of the other groups are groups of color. Look at those rates of growth. Where your growth is coming from is going to be among those groups of color and the Hispanic population in the years ahead. And ladies and gentlemen, this is why we better be happy that we got every immigrant coming to this country because we're gonna be in deep, deep yogurt if we build a wall around the country 
And it's all, and the reason we're going to be in deep yoga is because we're in the midst of an unprecedented demographic transformation. And the, that demographic transformation is inherent in our age structure and our fertility rates. But let me just show you, 51% of net growth in our population during the first decade of the new millennium was Hispanic. If you go up and ask, well, what did the non-Hispanic white population contribute to the growth? 17%. 100 minus 17 is what? Glad y'all ain't running the finances in your operation. 83% of net growth in our population during the first decade of the new millennium was driven by people of color. That's what I mean by the browning of America. And that will drive growth in the years ahead. And the reason it's going to drive growth is because of differential age structures. Ladies and gentlemen, what you have to understand is that immigration and migration are age-selected processes. Far more young people migrate and immigrate than older people. Doesn't mean old people don't move, they move slower and are lower propensity than young folks. <laughs> now, look at the median age of our population in this country in 2009. 37 years old. Half of us older than that, half of us younger than that. Now go down and look at the median age of the Hispanic population. What was it? 27. How many of you have heard that Hispanics are a burden on our health care system? Heard that? People just start nodding. What kind of major health problem do you have when your median age is 27? Huh? Now before you answer that, go back up and look at the median age of the white non-Hispanic population. What is it? 40, no, no, white, non, white non-Hispanic, 41. Now, see if you look at that through a health care prism, when you're 27 years old, when you're in your 20s, you usually have acute crises. You stick your finger in the lawnmower and you got to go get it glued back on. When you're in your 40s, what kind of health problems do you have? Chronic conditions that are what? Very expensive. I know that up front and close. I lost my wife to cancer at 48. Her treatment in the last six months of life was $5,000 a week. And you say, well, his parents have a whole lot of children. I ain't seen a child that costs $5,000 a week yet. Okay? Understand that. Now, ladies, there's something in demography called completed fertility. Okay? It's when you tell your husband, go take out the trash. Ain't nothing else happening here. <laughs> Completed fertility occurs for women between the ages of 40 and 44, okay? What's the median age of a non-Hispanic white female in America? 42.6? Now, look at the median age of all of those women of color. Where's your growth going to come from? See, ladies and gentlemen, this is not sociology, it's biology. <laughs> we are an aging population an aging population. And to further make the case, there's something called the completed fertility rate. It's the number of kids you have to have to replace yourself. In a statistical sense, if you're in a relationship, it takes 2.1 kids to replace yourself. Okay, don't ask me about the point one, you just gotta be rocking and rolling, okay? <laughs> who is up here, look at those numbers, if it's 2.1, who's replacing themselves in America today? It's basically one group. I'm going to show you the one for black is pretty shaky. It's basically one group. Non-Hispanic whites have a fertility rate of 1.9, and it's been that way for 20 years. What does that mean? The average non-Hispanic white family has 1.9 kids. Now, I don't know how you get 0.9 of a kid. I taught a few of them in my day. <laughs> Takes 2.1 kids to replace yourself. They're below replacement level, ladies and gentlemen, and because of an aging population, that won't change. You've aged out of the what? Childbearing years. Now, some of you say, hmm, I'm going home and fix this tonight. <laughs> what I would say is leave now. <laughs> Get a running start. At every stoplight, let it cycle two, three or four times. You might squeeze out one, but you ain't gonna squeeze out the difference between what a 27-year-old can do and what you as a 44-year-old can do. 
We see it in the um, birth curve. Ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, uh, we've, we're in an era of momentous change. In 1990, 66% of all births in America were to white, non-Hispanic white families. That number dropped to about 50% by 2008, and you all, I'm sure you captured it last week. In, what, 2011, for the first time in history, Non-Hispanic whites are no longer responsible for the majority of kids born in America. They're down below 50%. It's all inherent in these kinds of dynamics that we're talking about here. For the first time in history, 49.6% of all kids born in America are non-Hispanic white. And that share will continue to drop because of the aging and differential fertility that we find ourselves in the midst of. And so the kids that come in, we're talking about now a profound change in the racial and ethnic complexity of our society, what some people call a heck of a color adjustment. In 2005, 67% of all of our U.S. population was non-Hispanic white. Ten years earlier, it was 74%. Now we think by 2050, it's going to be about 47% or below 50%. And then Blacks 13%, uh, Hispanics 29, Asians 9, then you got a whole mixture of other things. When I talk about the browning of America, what I'm talking about is the source of growth and where are you going to see it first? Huh? No, yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> but if a kid is born today, where are they going to be? Schools. Five years from now, you know, that kid opened the door in about 12 different languages. That's, that's what's going to happen. That's what's going on. Further, comp let me go back here. Further complicating things, my second trend here, third trend, marrying out is in. <laughs> this is about, uh, you all know until about 1968, it was illegal for blacks and whites to marry in America. We had anti miscegenation It just seems stupid now, doesn't it? Well, this is not about blacks and whites marrying. This is about a far more complicated mix of marriages in society. This is about out-marriage. Out-marriage is in. If you look at the data very carefully, what you will see is that the, the, the rate of out-marriage means you marry somebody of a different racial or ethnic group has doubled uh, between 1980 and 2008, six, from 6.7% 6 of all marriages to about 15% among newly married couples. And it went from about 3.2% to about 8% of all of currently married couples uh, being married to someone of a different ethnic group. Who's doing it? The higher your education level, the more likely you are to out-marry. Makes sense. I mean, the market is just bigger as you go up, the, the, the marriage market. Although, it's, I'm going to show you in a minute, it ain't that big. but. Uh, <clears throat> So who's doing it? Hispanics and whites are marrying. Asians and whites. Groups where both groups are non-white, Asians and blacks, blacks and Hispanics, blacks and Asians marrying. And then there's a other group there. I don't know what y'all doing. It's just a mix of stuff there that I can't figure out. But you do about 14. Um, if you look at the census, the second largest and most rapidly growing population in the 2000 census behind Hispanics were people who were two or more races. Because you know you could self-identify in the census. You didn't have to fit in those categories. About 14 million people self-identified in that two or more race category. And so the kids that walk in your door won't fit the what? Nice, neat little crucibles. And the families that you find yourself dealing with won't fit the nice and neat little crucibles that we find ourselves in. Uh, Asians have the highest out mar marriage rate, his followed by Hispanics, blacks, and then whites in terms of this. But this too is dramatically transforming our population and the mix of our population. All of this is important because the silver tsunami is about to hit. Now, whereas the browning of America is about the change in racial and ethnic complexion of our society, the graying of America is about the aging of our native-born population. Now, you might ask the question, how do you know if you're part of the graying of America? <laughs> there are actually four ways, okay? Number one, if you have difficulty seeing the screen, you're part of the graying of America. Number two, if you got to go to the restroom three times during this presentation, you're part of the graying of America. Number three, it's about 9 or 9.30 in the morning. If you fall asleep during this presentation, you're part of the graying of America. 
more seriously, let me see a show of hands in here. How many of you were born between 1946 and 1964? Everybody. <laughs> Those of us born between 1946 and 1964 are part of the post-World War II hormonal rush in America. Our fathers went off to World War II and came back home and got busy. They got busy to the tune of producing 80 million of us. On January 1st of 2011, the first baby boomer born in America turned 65 and became eligible for what? Everything. <laughs> Over the next 20 years, ladies and gentlemen, everybody that raised their hand in this room are going to be exiting the labor market. And it will be a huge exit. We're known as the boomer generation, the boomer cohort. Let's look at us. Those of us who were boomers in 2009 were between the ages of 45 and 64. See, there were 79 million of us. About 17 million of us entered that category during that decade. Growth rate of 27%, and the 65 population continued to grow. Look at the 25 to 44-year-old population. What happened to it? began to decline. Why? Remember I told you that we entered an era of baby bust. We stopped having children in sufficient numbers to replace ourselves. Do the math, ladies and gentlemen. If you close the borders and the light and don't allow young people to come in, what do you got left? The Ben Gay crowd. <laughs> ben Gay crowd. So we got a couple of things happening, ladies and gentlemen. We are an aging, the silver tsunami is that 80 million people who are aging out. And then those of us, how many pre-boomers born before 1945? See? Now these folks are going to live another 18.7 years. Okay? We don't die, we multiply. Okay? They're going to live another 18.7 years on average. And ladies and gentlemen, we now think that living to 100 is well within reach on a routine basis. Why? We're taking better care of ourselves. We have medical advances and the like. And now we have this new research on regenerative medicine, where we, in North Carolina, we have a scientist who has regenerated a bladder. So your bladder wear out, we get you another one. <laughs> Somebody's working on an esophagus and they're like, now some of y'all can't go through the, the, the screening at the airport already because you got, got fake hips, fake lips and everything, things just going all off. They don't know where to feel to figure you out. But ladies and gentlemen, this raises a serious problem for us. Because on the one hand, we stop having children in sufficient numbers to replace ourselves and we're all doing what? Aging out. Who going to pay for you? So security and the like. Don't say your children, because they ain't. <laughs> this is called the dependency problem. It's called the dependency problem. That's why the debate about Social Security and the like is such a big issue for us, but it, it has uh, larger implications for us that I'll come back to in just a moment. Uh, we're talking about. That's how often we're turning 65, to the tune of about 8,000 per day. Okay? And we're turning 50, about 12,000 per day, uh, 11, 5 to about 50, 55, and about 9,200 to age 62 per day. How many of y'all heard 60 is a new 30? Yeah. <laughs> See, no uh, women uh, in yellow spandex on TV switching. <laughs> Let me tell you something, 60 is 60. This aging thing is going to continue, and ladies and gentlemen, what it means for your organizations, there's something, this creates what is called a succession problem. See, all of you are going to age out. Where's the next generation? Well, yeah, they may be sitting over there. Let me tell you how big this problem, this succession problem is. I've done two studies for uh, my university in the UNC system. They asked me to estimate what percentage of us on the faculty were aging baby boomers and what percentage in the 16 campus system. The answer at Carolina is 66% of us are aging baby boomers. How do you think about replacing two-thirds of your workforce? Okay. And in the UNC system, the number is 77%. Got two issues there. 
One is, where does the next generation of talent going to come from? And it won't look like y'all. And number two, how do you ensure that all, I mean, you all got some incredible experiences in this room. The second part of the succession problem is how do we ensure that that knowledge get transferred to what? The next generation. It's a huge kind of problem that most people don't think about, um, but it is on us, and that's what the silver tsunami is all about. The most rapidly growing population moving forward is going to be the elderly population. The slowest growing population will be uh, our young people and prime working age people, and that's why you can't afford to be anti-immigrant, because you can't go home and fix it. You're too old. <laughs> on average. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in history, we're going to have, we do now have four generations of people, gotcha, in the workplace. The nine millimeter just showed up. Uh, uh, four generations of people in the workplace. Uh, everybody from the pre-boomer who's most familiar and happy with the rotary dial phone to Gen Y who waltzes in at 9.30 in the morning with two buds in the ear whistling. And then there are all of you baby boomers who arrived at 5 o'clock in the morning because that's the way we roll. <laughs> and Gen Y at about 3.30 in the afternoon say, yo, I'm out of here. See you, wouldn't want to be you. You look at Gen Y and say, they got a bad work ethic. They, work, work ethic. they look at you and say, you can't spell work ethic because I finished in the first 15 minutes I was here what you've been navel gazing at all day long. And then there's you that has to manage those four generations. And all of them are important, ladies and gentlemen. And so that's what, uh, in terms of organizations, that's what it means for you. This is the growing dependency. The darker the color, the more dependency you have. Those dark brown counties, there are more non-working people than there are working folk. You can't sustain yourself like that. In North Carolina, we got 18 counties where the dependency rate exceeds 100. At 100, you got one worker for every, what, dependent. We got them that exceed. You can't sustain yourself. That's the social security problem right there. That's the health care problem. And all of us are faced with it, and it's not trivial. I only got seven minutes left, so let me get to this. Now it's time to get mad, y'all dogging me. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the other big trend for the first time in history during the first decade of the new millennium, women are about to surpass men as the numerical majority in the paid workforce. Women constituted 49.8%. And this, the operative term is paid workforce. Y'all have worked all your lives. Now, you know, we, we decided to pay you something, a little bit. That's the good news, okay? But the reason that you are becoming the new majority is not so much because we decided to treat y'all fairly. It's because men are doing so poorly in America today. Let's look at it. The plight of men. Today, three times as many men of working age do not work at all compared to 1969. Why don't they work? Skills mismatches, meaning they're not finishing school and getting the skills that they need. Incarceration and disabilities. Huge disability population. Percentage of prime age men receiving disability doubled between 1970 and 2009. Since 1969, the median wage of the American male has declined by about $13,000 after accounting for inflation. And since 1970, after peaking in 1977, male college completion rates have barely changed over the last 35 years. Where are the men? And if you look at it, in 2010, we granted 572,000 more degrees to men, women than we did men. The sex ratio in higher education has been 60% female, 40% male for the last decade. Where are the men? Look at, I just gave you some, look at the enrollments in two-year colleges, male enrollment, first, second, third, fourth column in the 40s in the U.S. and the Southeast region and in North Carolina. If you look at our system, UNC system, 44% male. For the majority of certain predominantly white schools, it's 46%. For the 
minority schools and Native American schools is 38 and HBUs 37. That means 37% male. Where are the men? And if you look at it in terms of households and look at households and mothers who have children, uh, what you see is in about 1967, 27% of those mothers were either breadwinners or co-breadwinners. Fast forward to 2007, when that number is 63%. And more, they're more likely to be what? Breadwinners than co-breadwinners. Where are the men? <clears throat> well, some, one clue is that men have been devastated in economic downturn. Uh, if you look at the 2007-2009 recession, uh, some people call it a man session because 80% of the job loss was among males. But it's more complicated than that. It has something to do with men just uh, are not uh, finishing school. And it starts early, ladies and gentlemen. It starts when you all see kids, if not earlier, uh, in terms of the deteriorating status of little boys, particularly boys of color in our society. And the good news, ladies, is you all are doing really, really well. The bad news is if you're not hitched already, now this is something y'all can take to your next book club. <laughs> bridge party. <laughs> There's something in demography called the MMPI. Y'all write this down. MMPI. Ladies. And what you need to know is it ain't on your side, okay? The MMPI is the Male Marriageable Pool Index. <laughs> there are not enough educated, eligible, marriageable men to go around today. I gave a talk similar to this in, I gave a talk similar to this in, in uh, Georgia a couple of weeks ago. And when I said that, some lady stood up and said, you drove all the way down here to tell me that. I knew that already. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger for the message. And so this, but this has profound implications for our society, this institution of marriage, the stability of our communities, and what the kid that walks in the door is going to be confronted with in the years ahead. It's a profound kind of change in our society. The good news is women are doing really, really well. The bad news is men aren't doing well, and it has implications. Let me rush to my last uh, Message to my, my last trend, cooling water from grandma's well and grandpa's too. Some of you know the, study, the, the song by the Williams brothers, um, cooling water from grandma's well reminds me of. This trend is about the most rapidly growing household type the first decade of the new millennium. Grandparents raising grandchildren. If you look at the data, all households with children grew by about 3.8%. Traditional leave it to beaver households, husband, wife, and children grew by 1.4%. Households where both grandparents are present raising grandchildren, 42%. Grandmother only raising grandchildren, nine. Grandfather got responsibility for child raising, 28%. Now, some of y'all thinking about this like your grandma and mine. Okay. My grandma was 97 when she died. She had an AARP card when I was born. But about 30% of these grandmothers are between the ages of 30 and 50. Okay? So don't be looking all cross-eyed when one of your employees walks in and at 30, that's about 30 years old and says, I need time off this afternoon because I got to go to school to look after my what? My grandchild. Don't be looking cross-eyed at them. We built a school in Durham for disadvantaged kids. I have a 45-year-old great-grandmother as a caregiver. See, demography is pretty predictable. 15, 15, 15 to get you there every day. Okay? By the way, if y'all want a good job, get a big salary increase every year, become a demographer. It's the most predictable thing in the world. If you're five years old today, five years from now, you'll be 10 years old if you just tell a lie. <laughs> Come same time every year. Just add one to it. You make you look brilliant to your boss. Walk in and say, you know, I was 10 years old last year. I'm 11 this year. Not only are the kids in the house with the grandparents, but there's a good chance that one or both of the biological parents are there too. You know, we're talking about, so you got two groups of grandparents. Now some of the grandparents are your grandparents and mine, but they're on their what, third or fourth tour of duty with child rearing and are totally outmatched with the responsibilities that they have. 
Because these kids are a digital generation. It's a total, it's a, it's a, the challenges are, to, look at the numbers. Uh, this is between 2005 and 2010. Number of grandparents responsible for grandchildren grew from what? 671,000 to 1.4 million. And the, the, the child's parents in the household grew from 290,000 to what? 946 dollars. This deep recession and the housing bubble and crisis has forced people to do what? And so that's poverty. That's poverty. And these seniors got all kinds of challenges themselves already. All of those. Some of y'all got these too, by the way, but it's all right. <laughs> this is the triple whammy, ladies and gentlemen. For you boomers. See, you, some people call it the sandwich generation. We aging boomers are facing mortality ourselves. And many of us have elder care responsibilities. You know. And my family, until recently, I had eight people between the ages of 85 and 97. I was scared to pick up the phone sometimes. <laughs> In fact, my uncle, he didn't... He, he, 88 called me the other day, said he needed a new car. <laughs> I said, what for? I got a, grand, I got a girlfriend across town. <laughs> I said, have you ever heard of the senior citizen discount on the bus? You need to get one. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, this, this is the silver tsunami. Elder care is going to replace child care as the dominant challenge in our lives in the future. And elder care is different from child care. Child care is pretty routine. Elder care is whenever the phone rings. And it's going to challenge us. So we got this triple whammy thing here that we got to deal with in the years ahead. I'm going to leave you with one thing to think about because I think this strikes at, where's the lady? With the, where am I? One minute. One minute. <laughs> Shoot, I walked all the way out here. I'm going to take two. I'm going to leave you with this thought. This is, I think we all have, I don't think we understand how vulnerable our children are today, and I want to leave you with this thought. This is a racial typology of, of the U.S. These are counties here. The red counties on this map are what we call racial generation gap counties. The adult voting age population in these counties are predominantly white aging empty nesters, okay? but the school age population is predominantly minority. What kind of support for public education you get in those places? That's the ain't got no dog in the fight voting population. The gold counties on this map are major minority majority counties. The adult voting age population is minority and the school age population is minority. Lots of interest and support in education, what's missing? Ain't no money there. No money there. That's right. Money's missing. Now, the white counties up there, that white space, are majority, majority counties. Dope population predominantly white, school age population predominantly white. But in those counties, about a third of the kids who go to school in those counties are kids of color. But if you peer beneath the veneer, what you will see is, is in those counties, those kids of color are either attending racially isolated schools within those districts or they're racially isolated within the school. In other words, we're in an era of resegregation. I was born in 1954, the year of Brown versus the Board of Education. And schools today are more segregated than they were in 1954. Ladies and gentlemen, the red and the gold are the new majority in America. That's the next generation of people that has to propel our nation. You leave them uneducated, not with proper health care and all of that, we can't compete. It's over. It's over. And whenever you run into somebody, ladies and gentlemen, who say, I don't have a dog in the fight because their kids are no longer in school, and tell them, yes, they do. Tell them Jim Johnson said, yes, they do. It's called the competitiveness of our nation. We cannot compete, thrive, and prosper leaving this generation of kids behind. Put that in your pot and boil it. Sell it everywhere you go because our competitiveness in the global marketplace hinges upon fixing all of that. 
black and brown kids in the South, Indian reservations, things of that nature up there. I'm through. Thank you so much for that wonderful, entertaining, but very factual and um, informative presentation. Okay, so we're about to embark on two and a half days of great training and education. But before we do that, I want to tell you all, because I'm sure you're wondering, what the Supreme Court is doing today. How many of you wonder about that? Well, they will not be voting on the they will not be entertaining the Affordable Care Act today, so you don't have to worry about it until maybe Thursday, I guess. So that's my one announcement. And housekeeping, I just want to remind you all as you um, go back from the conference or while you're enter while you're um, in the sessions, make sure that you complete the evaluations or think about the evaluations in your mind. And when you get back home. Go to our website or even in the evening you can go to the website on your computers in your room and go to nasbic.org go to the convention web page and go to evaluations and please fill out the evaluations it's really important for us to know the work that we do or what new things you'd like to hear about it's really important to us from that perspective but also for your continuing education if you don't complete your evaluations you don't get your CEs and you must do that by August 10th and that's it. So I dismiss you now to go to A Sessions. Have fun. <laughs>